Hi everyone. Welcome to the uh, Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society's lecture series uh, for Manitoba. So I will be uh, giving this presentation on, on behalf of uh, John Hansack. So I'm uh, Pat McCarthy, a uh, meteorologist and I've uh, been involved with this program for quite a while. Now this course is called Sphere Thunderstorm, Storm Chasing and Field Techniques and has been around for over 15 years and it's offered at the University of Manitoba. The uh, inspiration for our course uh, goes back to 1991 when I met uh, Paul Savatka. He's here uh, on his knee. Uh, he's a, he's a, a, a he works at the College of the Page, and that, that's near Chicago. And he he has been teaching students about atmospheric uh, sciences for a while. And he came up with this idea of creating a a storm chasing kind of tour uh, tour. So he would uh, teach a number of students about storm chasings, how they form, and so on, and then would have the group pile into these vans and go storm chasing. This way, they could apply their knowledge to real life things. And uh, I got to know uh, Paul way back then. And uh, over the years, um, we, we ended up deciding to do something similar. Now there are other, uh, a few small number of universities where they, they do something similar. They go back as far as 1996, which was uh, when the, Twist, the movie Twister came out, became popular. Um, but as you can see here, there's just a small a sample of, of, a, of a small number of, uh, of universities doing this. Now this seems very similar to uh, storm chasing tours. And there are a number of storm chasing tours. Most of these formed after that movie Twister back in 1996. And uh, you can see the prices, uh, you know, generally how much they cost. So. Uh, per week, maybe about $2,000 per week, and, and if not more. And what they do is they take uh, their guests, and they're typically weather tourists, and they go out and they um, try to track down storms, and they're pretty good at it. And uh, so they, they uh, the people that are watching that, they're out there to get pictures and, uh, and to experience extreme weather. There's very little in the way of, uh, you know, formal uh, instruction like uh, like you're seeing in the course that we're talking about. So in, in 2005, having uh, wondered about creating something similar here in the University in, of Manitoba, uh, we eventually did that in 2005. Now this course is available uh, for atmospheric science students. It's a four credit course and so uh, those students get priority. If uh, there are empty spaces, and there usually are, is, uh, usually are empty spaces. Uh, other university students uh, can, uh, can apply to go on the course, as well members of the public. So typically, we get about um, you know, 13 or 14 students uh, involved. That's about the, as much as we can have these days. And of course, we have the instructors and maybe a, a driver or two to handle the, uh, the workload. Course is about twelve hundred fifty dollars in twenty twenty three money, and that's pretty cheap. So you're getting a class, which is um, a, a a large class to go to, and as well you get to go on a field trip. And this field trip is a seven day trip, and it includes all your accommodations, you know, the rentals on the vans, the gas, and so on. So it's a really good deal compared to say some of the uh, tour companies. Uh, prices that I showed you earlier. So there, are, we have, this also includes 12 classes of instruction. So it's, uh, it's uh, you get quite a lot for your money. So here are the four instructors, John Hasek, uh, Dave Carlson, meteorologist with Environment Canada. Uh, there's me up there, Pat McCarthy, and I am retired from the Environment uh, Canada, was a super weather forecaster. Jay Henderson there relaxing at the bottom. He uh, likewise 
a retired uh, severe weather meteorologist. So the four of us have extensive experience in training and uh, meteorology and storms. And uh, we are all storm chasers as well. So the course, when we have it, begins in early May. We do about we do two hour two lectures per week, and for each class we do some lecture, and then we go move on to hands on labs. So the idea is you're learning stuff, and then we apply it and get them get the students having experience. Uh, it's, so because of that, there's a fair bit to go over, and uh, tend, the classes tend to be about two to three hours long. So total, it's uh, almost 40 hours of instruction and practice that the students get before we do the field trip. <clears throat> so the course outline, here's the 12 classes. Essentially, we cover you know, severe uh, thunderstorms, how to do analysis of uh, surface and upper air information. We look at stability uh, and instability. We look at shear because that helps um, take the type of storms you're going to get. And we have uh, a nice little technique, uh, an old technique that's been used to uh, incorporate all the information so that it'll help pinpoint where the most likely area for uh, severe storms will be, which is what we're trying to find with our, with our field trip. And of course, we have to teach them about the radar satellites and uh, the notion of now casting and short range forecasting. And the last class is an important class. I mean, we cover the field trip preparations. We talk about storm spotting, uh, photography, and so on. But the most important part, and this is why it's a required uh, attendance, is safety. I mean, there is a, well, definitely a level of uh, hazard uh, and danger with these uh, with, with uh, storm chasing. And so we go all go over all that, and we give them strategies as to what we'll be doing and how we'll be trying to keep us safe while still uh, uh, still learning out in the field. So for for 2023, uh, our field trip uh, window it's about it's a 10 day window. So sometime between the 17th and 26th, we will we'll begin a a five uh, day uh, sorry a seven day window. So there's a lot of uh, lingo on a course like this. So if you ever, if you're not familiar with the, uh, you know, what the what the people do is there's a lot of jargon that you have to acknowledge. And this is just a, a small sample of the stuff that you have to know. The atmosphere science students tend to, you know, know a lot of this already. But for the other students and the uh, public uh, people that are with us. Uh, this, this can be a bit of an obstacle. So, but over time, they pick it up. We, we really help the students along uh, to understand these things. And we, we're constantly repeating and repeating and repeating. And by the time the field trip comes along, they've got a pretty good handle on it. And normally by the end of the trip, field trip, they, they're doing really well. So the field trip is a a teaching trip so we're not just there having, having fun storm chasing so every day we have a, a lot of activities so like here in the more picture here is a, in the morning in a hotel room we're going over you know yesterday's weather you know what worked what didn't work and we're going over today's weather and so on they uh, as the when we're going out in the field heading out towards the storms uh, they usually form late in the day so we often have times to take breaks and we, this is another teaching moment. So we talk about, you know, well, how things are evolving, what do you think is going to happen, what clues should we, we be looking for, you know, to help narrow our target. And then when we get into the field and we're into the chasing storms, uh, we have a lot of information in the, in the vehicles. It's changing quickly. And the students, um, we teach the students about, the, about what's going on. So we now have like, uh, uh, monitors up front and in the back of the vans so people can uh, follow along with what's going and they ask a lot of questions and again a lot of the stuff is learned in this period and finally when we're at the storms um, it's a great uh, opportunity to educate as well they ask a lot of questions you know we're in the field and they might ask is that is that you know what 
you know, the overshooting top that you, you're talking about. And uh, yeah, we can show exactly what it is and we can show which ones aren't. And we can, we can show, uh, you know, how the storms are changing. And what the, the, the students really appreciate this, you know, that going from classroom all the way to uh, what's, what's happening and seeing exactly uh, all the things that we were talking about coming together, it's very, very, uh, uh, it's a very, very successful approach. So to get a taste of what's going on that those days, we divide the teams, the vans up into teams. So let's say we have three vans. So there's, there's equal number of students in each uh, van and, uh, and they, they become a team. And so they get together the first thing in the morning. Uh, here, the picture here and is in a hotel uh, breakfast room, but it could be in a, a hotel room or somewhere else, even outside. And the, the students sit down and they do all their analysis and they put that information together and with that information and looking at other information into the future, they can uh, try to make a prediction. And so this morning, this, this analysis that diagnosis that's done in the morning is really important to help identify triggers. But the students are separated and they're coming to a, a team conclusion. And so once that, that uh, is done, each team goes, uh, goes out and presents what they found and what they think is going to happen to the rest of the group. So all the instructors and the, and the other uh, teams can watch that, like, for example, this team here, give the presentation and then later ask questions and uh, you know, try to get a good appreciation of what's going on. Now, they're, they're being marked by the instructors while this is being done. So how they, 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 they uh, the logic and stuff that they're doing with this uh, presentation is really important. And then each team has a, does this and then they come up with target areas. The instructors come up with a target area, but we don't tell the students what they what that target is at that time of the morning, uh, because there's still a lot of learning to, that can happen as you go along. So as things change, you know, the, the students will start seeing how maybe their targets need to be revised as the weather is changing. So the area that we do this this chasing is uh, in what we call the the the, the plains of uh, of uh, North America, the central plains of North America. And within this area here, uh, we have the northern, central, and southern plains, uh, including like as we when we include uh, Canada. It's a huge, vast area, perfect for storm chasing because uh, it's wide open and stuff. Where, where there's trees, you can't really storm chase. <clears throat> so. We could be chasing up here, say near Edmonton, or chasing way down here in Texas. So that's about it's over three thousand kilometers to to from that one end to the other. So on a day to day basis, we could be seeing storms all, all over the place, and so it's, it's, we typically go over five thousand kilometers, and sometimes a lot more on our trips, our seven day trips. Sometimes we're stuck in an area and we spend all the whole trip down in, let's say, this part of the country for. For whatever reason that's just the way the weather pattern shows up so you never know what it's going to be until we get out there so when we chase so the course wraps up around uh, mid-june we first started we were into the july period we preferred the july period because we didn't expect to be chasing into the united states well, that far and most of the activity was occurring there so initially we would be doing a lot of our planning for chasing in this area but over time, uh, we thought it was actually to be better to be a little more into to June. And our, we, we're now in the June period. What this does is here's the, the general pattern for American tornadoes, and this is the Canadian prairie tornadoes, is that they're both pretty high in this window. So you can see it's still high, it's high in Canada side, and it's still pretty high in the American side. So this is our chase window now for the course. The field trip will be in this window. <clears throat> so the course has evolved over the years. So I'm not going to go. I'm going to go over each of the courses just to show you how things have changed. Now, the first one was uh, in 2005, and again we're using the, uh, the, the January, sort of the July peak on the Canadian side. We, we didn't expect that we we're going to be going too far south on this trip, and um, we saw storms. Uh, nothing too crazy, but it was 
it was fun. It was a fun trip. Uh, the border crossings was a little bit of an issue because, you know, when you're chasing uh, back and forth across the border because the weather doesn't care about the cross uh, borders. Uh, after a while, you know, the American and Canadian uh, border crossing guys were, you know, kind of wondering what the heck we're doing. And so they would sit down and talk to us so, quite often <laughs> until we, they were happy with what we, what we were doing. So tools are, were pretty limited back then. They, the cellular network was pretty slim, you know, 1G type of, so out in the plains, a lot of open areas, there may not be any coverage at all. So we're always looking for data and uh, part of it be done by war driving, which is a technique of just driving around, say move into a small town or you know, someplace. And there was always lots of open uh, uh, Wi-Fi locations. So we just log on, get the data we wanted and move and moved on. But for the most part, we stuck to libraries and hotels. Uh, libraries had PCs, instructors would go in, look at the latest data, and then run off, run off again and continue to follow the storms until we got to the next library. We often used hotels as well. You know, we would ask them for the permission, like during the day, you know, we stop there and say, can we use your Wi-Fi? And they say, what for? And we say, we're storm chasing. Oh, that sounds cool. And then they, they'd be, they they were always happy to let us do this, <clears throat> which was nice. So our second course in 2006, same mid-July window, same uh, with two vans, a lot of storms. We spent most of our time in Alberta, lots of storms, really nice ones. And then we drove all the way to, to Iowa at, towards the end of the trip. It looked like it was going to be a spectacular day. And at the last, it just fizzled. The, all the ingredients were there, but the, they just wouldn't come together. Um, the free press, uh, the uh, map, the Winnipeg Free Press came along, uh, a photographer and, uh, and journalist uh, did the whole trip and they wrote up a pretty nice uh, multi-page article in the newspaper about what we were doing. <clears throat> we tried to uh, improve our tools, so we still had like a simple cell phones, still doing the war driving, but we added uh, radios uh, to help communicate better between the vans, uh, added a weather station to the roof of one of the vans, we had strobe lights and si um, reflectors so that uh, whenever we pulled over, we, we'd, we'd be uh, very visible. So we didn't want people driving into us uh, on the side of the roads. We had signage to identify who we were and we had more mounts and stuff to our cameras. In uh, 2007, the third course, uh, still using the fixed window, but this time we had three vans. This, was becoming, uh, this course was becoming popular. <clears throat> Um, we spent a lot of time in the Alberta foothills again, another Alberta, <coughs> excuse me, trip. And uh, one of the days there was, uh, the setup looked really spectacular and the uh, professional meteorologists were saying it looked like a, the Edmonton tornado day, but it turned out to fizzle, though we're mobile, we were able to find uh, some pretty good storms anyway, uh, but nothing tornadic. Our tools, essentially the same again, but this time we added another weather station, another, sorry, uh, yeah, weather station. So there was the original one with the nanometer and its sensors on top, and this is a, a new one mounted to another van, and it was a solid state one. So it was an AirMar system, and it was pretty good. You could get data right into the vehicles, and so it was very interesting for the students. Uh, we skipped a year, went to 2009, and from this point on, all our trips are are with an odd number at the end because it's a uh, it's a it's a lot of work, and there just aren't that many summer uh, that, that many atmospheric science students coming through the system to um, at least back then to uh, allow us to run the courses. So we do it every second year now. We start to shift our window into the June period. And because of that, we're more likely to be in, in the US. And this was an all US trip. And it was really good, 23 people in four vans. So it was a big course, uh, tons of great storms, no tornadoes, but it was <clears throat> quite the spectacular uh, trip. So our tools uh, continued for more or less the same, except we got this new system called ThreatNet, which allowed us to get uh, satellite based um, 
uh, information. So Sirius Radio would send information down to this software, this uh, hardware and, and software, and we would get in, uh, live radar data, lightning data, uh, satellite data, data, surface weather data, all kinds of information in here. You know, and it was GPS enabled so that you could see where we are with respect to the storm. So this really helped us. That's why we had such a successful trip. In 2011, the, 2000, uh, the uh, course five, this is the first time we started using the 10 day window. So instead of a fixed week that we would chase, we'd have a, some time within a 10 day window, we would have our seven day trip. And this allowed us a little bit more flexibility to zone in on the most active weather. So it was very successful. We had great storms, uh, 24 people, again, four vans, 24 people, and a documentary crew that gave us, uh, uh, that did, uh, produced a very nice uh, documentary on uh, our course. And the tools uh, uh, were more, more or less the same, but we were starting to get rid of stuff. We had, um, we added, we were starting to get these sticks, these uh, uh, mobile sticks. So we were getting data. We could add that data into our phone. So we had one, we had ThreatNet. So two of the four vehicles, so Chase 1 and Chase 2, had this information. So so instead of just one van, we had two vans. So it would be nice to have it in all vans, but this was the first time we used that. So that's that was nice. On uh, 2013's Core 6, we had our first tornado. And it was pretty close to the group, but it was, uh, it was quite exciting. We went back to three vans because we found that four vans on the previous two years, it was really hard to keep four vans together. You know, you're often losing each other because uh, it's storms and then crossing roads and, and so on. It was really hard to keep everybody together. And there were times where we had no idea where some vans were. So we went back to the three vans, which seemed to be more, more uh, uh, manageable. Uh, Global TV tagged along with our trip for a few days as well. So we start we got started using these uh, jetpacks. So it was a, a cell based uh, data that we could get, and um, because they were relatively cheap, we can get one for each van. So we didn't need the threat net anymore. So it was really nice to have that data. So everybody had information, and we had been adding. Uh, uh, monitors in the back of the vehicles as well so that you were seeing the same data that the instructors were seeing up front and then you could ask questions and, and point things out and it was very helpful they really like it you always look back and you see them all crowded around the the, uh, the monitor to see what was going on of course 7 2015 we, we saw four tornadoes on that trip a lot of great storms we were down in the u.s the whole time ctv came down and did a uh, with us for a few days to do some uh, live hits and presentations back in Canada. Here's one of our tornadoes. And uh, so we had the mobile data for all vehicles as we had before. So for the most part, really things hadn't, hadn't changed. So it seems like we had gotten um, pretty good with the adjustments that we've made over the year. And uh, course eight, uh, 2017, very successful down in the States. Same, same thing we had on the previous trip, everything just moving really well, very little way in, uh, in uh, modifying stuff. The only thing that we noticed on the 27 tour was that because da data from, uh, the Canadian, from the Canadian side of the border, when we crossed the border was used to be fairly prohibitive for to use your phone had come down enough that they had uh, some pretty good deals, you know, such as like a roam like home type of thing. And because of that, they were aware of other apps. So they would load their phones with these other apps and they could follow along there as well. So they were actually starting to circumvent a lot of the tools that we had because they had so much information that they could just get over their phones. 2029, the last or last class course, sorry. Uh, Again, down the states, very successful. Lots of tornadic, um, lots of storms with the tornado, tornado warm storms, but uh, no tornadoes. They just like this one here was forming, uh, but it just never touched the ground. But anyways, it was a very successful trip. 
So there was no uh, course in uh, 2021 because of the, uh, the pandemic, but there will be a course uh, this year, uh, 2023. So overall, we've graduated, uh, 118 students have graduated from this course and 17, uh, sorry, 18 of them eventually became uh, meteorologists in, and have gotten jobs in varying capacities. If you want to know more about the course or you're looking maybe to take it, this course, uh, as of the, the time of this uh, presentation, we haven't really been posting it, but about seven of the uh, uh, 13 or 14 seats are already spoken for. So if you're looking to, like to try going on this course or something, you can call uh, or want more information, you can call uh, John in his email. And uh, the little pitch for the atmospheric science program at the U of M, it's one of the few in, in Canada. Uh, they have a you know, full program, honors program there. And uh, the, the people that have graduated have gotten found jobs in many of these different fields. There's, you'll be surprised how much uh, atmospheric science is being used across the many uh, sectors. And there's many, many opportunities for them. So. It's only one of the handful of courses, uh, sorry, a uh, handful of programs in the country. So if you're interested in that again, talk to John. So again, there's John's email. There's mine, this is the, the, from the CMOS, if you want to know more about CMOS. So with that, uh, I'll ask any questions. Do you have any questions? <laughs>